we can't really form a comprehensive understanding of the way muscles move without considering our skeletal system because of course it's the skeletal system that ultimately is responsible for the movement and supporting our bodies. So in this video we're going to look at the skeletal system and in particular we're going to look at the joints of the body. So a joint within the body is really in its simplest form is two, four, two bones that are connected together. And the joints that we're really interested in from a movement, a human movement perspective, are what we refer to as synovial joints. So synovial joints are unique because they have a lot of, they're capable of a lot of producing a lot of movement and they have this synovial capsule surrounding them that is full of this synovial fluid and the bones also have this cartilage barrier which aid, effectively aids smooth movement between the two bones. But in its simplest form, that is what a skeletal joint is. It's just two bones connected together. And they're connected by ligaments, which aren't shown in this generic video, but effectively that's what they are. They're two articulated bones. And they allow the body to move. So when a muscle contracts, they allow that movement to occur. So let's have a look at some examples of joints within the body and consider their shape and how they facilitate movement as well as the muscles that uh, connect to the bones. So the two important concepts that we need to consider when we're looking at joint movement are first of all the degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom and the range of motion or the ranges of motion. So a degree of freedom refers to the movement that a joint is capable of performing or capable of doing. And not all joints have the same degrees of freedom. In fact, a joint will typically have either one, two, or three degrees of freedom. So it means that a joint can either move in one, two, or three directions is a good way of considering this concept of degrees of freedom. The range of motion then refers to the amount, the amount of movement, movement, oh, that was a funny M, the amount of movement that a joint can produce through a particular degree of freedom. Now that might sound overly complicated, but really it's important to understand these two concepts because muscles then produce movement through a particular degree or degrees of freedom and they facilitate movement through a range of motion. So it's not just the joint, of course, that influences a, the range of motion of the joint, the flexibility of the muscle and so forth can influence it, but the structure of the joint can influence both the degrees of freedom and the ranges of motion that that joint can move through. So let's look at a simple example to start with and we'll consider the elbow. So the elbow you can see here is described as a hinge joint and it only has one gray arrow going backwards and forwards. As you might guess, that means that the joint only has one, and I'll use DOF to represent degree of freedom. It only has one degree of freedom that it can move through. And that means that effectively the elbow can only flex and then unflex, or as you would probably guess correctly, extend. So the elbow joint, uh, just that one component of that elbow joint can only move through one degree of freedom and that's referred to as flexion and extension. Now the amount that the forearm can flex up towards the upper arm and the amount of extension that it has is then the range of motion of flexion and extension that the elbow joint has.
And hopefully you can consider then, as you go to straighten your elbow, as you come down to the maximum range of motion of your elbow through extension, it stops, it all of a sudden locks out. And you can feel that bone on the back of your elbow effectively stopping you extending your arm anymore. And that's a good example of how the bone structure restricts the range of motion of that joint. So let's look at a very different joint now on the other side. At, we'll look at the hip joint. So you can see here the hip joint has one, two, three gray arrows around it. And this here is representing the pelvis. And this here is representing the thigh bone or the femur. So you can see here the hip has three degrees of freedom. It's capable of moving forwards and backwards or flexing and extending, flex, extending. It's capable of moving sideways, which was referred to as adduction, which is bringing the leg into the body and abduction, which is bringing the leg away from the body to the side. And the last, which is a really important movement for dancers, it's capable of rotating. Rotating. And rotating is, of course, the fundamental movement of turnout. So you can see the hip here has three degrees of freedom. And like the elbow joint, if the structure of the hip can influence the amount of turnout you have, the amount of extension you have through the hip, but also the muscles can influence the range of motion that that joint has or that you can produce through the hip joint. So now that we have an understanding of the macro and the microscopic structure of our muscle, remember that the muscles all connect to the bones and when they contract, when they shorten, they force the joints to move. And the joints will only move through the specific degrees of freedom that they are capable of. More so, they will only move so far as the total range of motion that they are capable of. Now, your range of motion can change. You can do flexibility training, you can get more extension, but your degrees of freedom are fixed. If However many degrees of freedom you see here, either through the elbow or the hip or the shoulder, whatever, they are fixed. You're only going to have those degrees of freedom for the entirety of your life because the skeletal system dictates that we can only have those certain degrees of freedom because of the structure of the joint. So now that we have a better understanding of joint structure, we can look at then how the interaction between the muscles and the joints work together in order to produce movement.